Hello, my name is Wilfred. I was told about the existence of a place where you can share strange or frightening encounters, so I'm going to tell you about a horrible event that happened about three years ago now. I lived on the second floor of a building in Nancy with my boyfriend. Unfortunately, at that time, me and my boyfriend were no longer getting along very well, and we decided to take a break. He went to go stay with his family for a few weeks, and I stayed in Nancy alone. If I want to be honest, I was not really handling it well. I was sleeping very little at night, to the point that night and day were almost reversed for me. One evening, I woke up at around 3 a.m. I had slept in all day. I got up and went to the kitchen to make myself something to eat. I put some tea in the pot, and in the meantime, I went out to smoke a cigarette on my terrace. I wasn't even fully awake yet. I was thinking deeply about my romantic situation. At some point, though, I realized that someone was out in the street and talking quite loudly. I didn't really pay it much mind, surely just a passerby who was on the phone. The voice faded until I couldn't hear it anymore. I turned my head back toward the road at some point, only to see the worst thing in my entire life which continues to scare me to this day. There was a man standing in the street, around 50 years old, with what appeared to be a large knife in his hand. He was completely naked and he was looking at me with these wild bug eyes. It took me a while to really understand what I was seeing here. It seemed so unreal to me that I thought I must be hallucinating. I didn't have time to even react or do anything when he suddenly started yelling at me. He began to scream and insult me and ask what I was doing here. I quickly entered my apartment and closed the door behind me. Even though I lived on the second floor and the man surely couldn't reach me, I still closed and locked it out of reflex. I remember I had never been so startled in my entire life. I even wondered how I hadn't pissed myself because it was so strange and scary. As I came more to my senses, I could still hear him outside screaming at me. The door was closed though, so I couldn't really understand what he was saying. All of a sudden, he stopped screaming. I couldn't hear anything for a short while. Then I began to hear some weird noises, as if he was hitting something. Once again, he began to screech into the air. Needless to say, the situation was very unnerving. At this point, I ran to my room and took my phone to call the police. At the same time as I was on the phone with them, I returned to my living room. I could hear the man screaming outside still. Once again, he stopped suddenly, and there was no more sound except for the sound of one last blow striking. The woman on the phone told me the police were already on their way. One of my neighbors had seemingly called as well. Obviously, he was screaming so loudly, it was waking everyone in the area up. After a few minutes, I saw the flashing lights of police vehicles. Afterwards, I took a few minutes to calm down before going downstairs to see the officers. They were talking with some other neighbors in the hall. When I arrived at the entrance, I saw that the glass door was damaged and there was blood all over it. It was assumed it was the man's, not a victim's, since no one had reported being injured. From what I understood, he must have struck his knife on the window, the noises which I'd heard earlier, which sounded like blows. He'd injured himself with his knife while trying to break in. The last sound I heard was him tossing his knife. Apparently, the neighbors on the first floor found it on their terrace. We think the man must have thrown it at them out of anger, perhaps. When I learned all that, I knew that he really wanted to get inside. For some reason, he was really focused on me, and nobody knew why. I still don't know why he was so mad at me in particular. I had never seen the man before in my life. I explained my version of events to the police, all while crying. The night was super long. I called a friend right after, so he could come pick me up and I could sleep at his place for a time, at least until my boyfriend came back. I heard a few days later from the neighbor who'd found the knife tossed at his home. They'd arrested the man a few streets away. 
Apparently, the man had some serious psychiatric problems. Without going into too much detail, he'd escaped the vigilance of his family, who would normally monitor him. He was caught threatening a passerby on another street, and now he's been sent to a psychiatric hospital. Even knowing that, though, me and my boyfriend decided to move to another area as quickly as possible. Even today, I avoid going back to Nancy, and I had nightmares for almost a year. We still don't know why he was so fixated on me in particular. Some advice for people as well, like the me of before who didn't see a point in going to a therapist after an experience like this. Just go ahead and try it. Honestly, it helped me a lot. Today, I'm clearly less anxious and paranoid than when this happened three years ago. I'm going to tell you a not very funny story that happened to me a few years ago when I was 18. From my point of view now, it seems even more serious than I thought it was at the time. To begin with, my name is Camille, and I lived in the Paris region at the time this story happened. I had just completed my bachelor's and was particularly free to do whatever I wanted with my free time before moving on to higher education. I had one goal, to find a nice guy to stick around with for a while. My big dream in life was to find a nice guy, marry, and have a family with lots of children. I wanted to do it young as well, to be able to live that life as much as possible. It really motivated me to find someone compatible to seriously settle down with as early as I felt comfortable. I registered on a dating site called Grinder. Now, those of you who are familiar with it may say, what a mistake. That's an app on which you can only find people who want sex. Well, I didn't really know that at the time. I remember back then I did a lot of sports and was kind of fit, and apparently other men liked me quite a bit already. I didn't really realize that, though. For me, waking up in the morning with a bunch of notifications from this app was normal. I was very naive back then, maybe a little blind, you might say. I received one message that I remember deciding to reply to. I spoke to this guy for several days. We sent each other photos. It was a crazy match between us. That had never happened with me and another guy before. Small detail, I discovered that I was gay at 18 years old, pretty much overnight without consulting anyone. So, meeting a guy so soon after was pretty crazy. After two weeks, we decided to meet up in person. He sent me his address. He lived in a beautiful suburban area, with very nice individual houses and all that. I went on my way and passed in front of all these beautiful places, each nicer than the other. I told myself deep down that I was kind of embarrassed to be seeing someone so rich. I didn't want to appear as though I was just a gold digger or something. I passed in front of all of the houses when I arrived in front of the number that indicated the address he had given me. I was surprised to find the place was a ruin. The garden wasn't even a garden, it was more of an equatorial forest. There was an invisible house pretty much, hidden amongst all the growing vegetation. I walked around the block a bit and tried to convince myself that this actually was the right place. I sent a message and the man answered immediately and told me that he was already there. Out of this forest, a man well into his 50s and not looking like the photos at all came to open a rickety gate for me to come inside. I told myself, surely this man must be the father of the person I'm talking to. Surely that guy is inside the house. With a big smile, I held out my hand to shake it. He aggressively kissed it with a smile on his face. Not very reassuring. I was very embarrassed and concerned now. The guy told me to follow him through the vegetation, and we arrived at the front door of the house, which was not facing the street, but hidden amongst the side with all the trees and other plants. It was well out of sight from the street view. He opened the door with a loud bang, and I entered behind him. 
that's where the nightmare really began. The house was almost in complete darkness. The windows were barricaded with boards nailed to them from the inside. There was so much dust that it formed a curtain with the large webs hanging from the ceiling. The floor was rotten, the walls the same, and above all, the smell was unbearable. It stung my eyes it stunk so much. It was not like the kind of smell you'd smell at a public toilet or something, though. It was the questionable smell of organic things rotting for quite some time. At that moment, three cats charged at me, meowing extremely loudly. They were all thin, filthy, and obviously not in good health. All this happened within a manner of seconds. I had just decided to turn around and leave, when the man instantly slammed the door behind me. I saw the door had a system of several bolts attached, in addition to the classic lock. The man locked them up extremely quickly. There was a staircase going upstairs, where the only real light was coming from. It was located immediately to the right of this entrance. The guy waved his hand to invite me in further. The, uh, downstairs is not quite finished yet, but come on, let's go upstairs. It's renovated up there. I got upstairs and same thing. Everything was disgusting. The only difference is that there was some light. He told me to take the first door on the left and I'd find a big surprise. There, the most incredible thing I'd ever seen happened. I don't know where to start. The window was sealed up and had bars on the outside. There was a mattress on the floor with all these horrible dark brown blankets. Above all, there were shelves on the walls from floor to ceiling with statues of fake Disney characters. This was strangeness beyond what anyone could imagine. I spotted a small chair in the corner of the room, which he forced me to sit on very quietly. From that moment on, I went into survival mode. I smiled big and gave the best attempt at conversation I could for several hours. Beneath the surface, I knew I was in some real trouble. The house was completely barricaded, and even if I was a big, sporty guy, the man in front of me could be armed. How was I to know what he could be hiding? The guy laid down on the mattress and stared at me as we talked, telling me countless times to come join him on the bed. I refused very politely and tried to act innocent, like a guy who understands nothing. After three or four endless hours, I received a message from my roommate, which had a different ringtone than all the other notifications on my phone. I took this opportunity. Damn, I didn't see the time. I have to go home. I have a party tonight. That's my roommate and they're expecting me. I grabbed up my things and told the guy I had to leave right now. They might get concerned if I didn't return quickly. I said we could continue to talk to each other on the app and that in any case we'd see each other again soon. The guy came with me to the front door. I'd tried to open it to escape, but I couldn't because the door was not locked with a classic locking system. There were all these weird levers and keypads and multiple deadbolts. I couldn't find a way to unlock it. The man fiddled with all the locks, pressed in the codes, and even scanned his fingertip, then said wait, because he had to get an additional key. It took him 15 minutes to come back, 15 minutes where I wondered if I was going to be blasted by a madman who lived here in the middle of hell. He finally opened the door, using three separate keys, and I finally saw the outside again. I ran under his arm, which he'd used to open the door. I crossed through the forest which served as his garden, and jumped the fence right in front of him. I ran and headed home faster than the speed of light. The guy harassed me for months after this meeting, with lots of different phone numbers. Only after many months did he finally stop. Over some time, thinking about it, I told myself that this guy must not even have been the owner of the house. That house was absolutely not being renovated, and it looked like he might have been squatting there. And the smell inside? I've never smelled that smell ever since, except one time when I stumbled across a decomposing hunter's kill in the forest. Without realizing it, my brain made an instant connection to the smell of that home back then, and at that moment I started to panic. The house smelled like corpses. 
I regret not having been aware of it at the time. I would have called the police straight away, if for nothing else than to check to make sure nothing more serious had happened in that house. No one takes me seriously when I tell this story, so I decided to share it here. The backstory is long, but I swear it's important. A few years ago, I was 17. I'd just graduated from high school and got my first job at a Christian camp near Yosemite in California over the summer. Mainly, the people I worked with were great, really sweet Christian college kids, the good kinds. There was one guy, though, who I'll call Carl, who quite frankly unsettled me. He was tall, handsome, and charming. He had curly golden brown hair and a smile that could stop your heart. His eyes, though, were completely dead. He would never get those little crinkles in the corner of your eyes when you're smiling. It was like the top half of his face was frozen. There were multiple things I didn't like about Carl right off the bat. His eyes, for one, that dead smile of his. He also never asked for anything. He tried to twist your arm. He'd very slowly try to manipulate the situation until you felt you almost owed him. Each time, it felt like a part of my brain shut down, like it slammed a door shut. There was a very clear feeling. Something about this guy is not right. Save him some food, but don't walk out into the woods to give it to him sort of thing. Something was wrong with this guy. I got along with most of the little cliques at the camp. No one really disliked each other as far as I knew. We broke off into groups based off what we liked to do in our free time, or who we spent the most time with. Carl, though, seemed to make friends one-on-one -on -one within a clique. By the time he left the group, it was decimated. They were fighting, not speaking, didn't trust each other. That's not a lot of evidence to go off of, but I'm trying to give you the picture of this man, how wrong he was. One day, everyone in camp decided to go to Fresno. We were tired of camp food and wanted some real dinner. You know, maybe see a movie or go bowling. I was the one to get off work last. Now, at camp we had this sign-out sheet. Being so close to Yosemite, we often went hiking after work, so if we left, we had to put our name down along with where we were going. We also had to write down when we should be expected back. That way, if something happened to us, they would know to start looking right away. I put all my info down on the sheet and headed down to the parking lot. My friends had all divided into their cars. I didn't drive at the time. I jokingly asked if they'd forgotten about me. They told me that Carl had said I was going to ride with him. I looked around, but I didn't see Carl anywhere, even though I had seen his name above mine on the sign-out sheet. All the hair on my body stood on end in that moment. I was terrified to get in the car with this guy alone. He was just so not right. I really honestly don't know how else to explain it. My friends were telling me I had nothing to be worried about, though. It would be fine. I saw Carl walking toward the parking lot, a weird smirk on his face, and everything in me told me to not get in his car. I said that I was tired and wanted to stay in tonight. Carl tried to lay on the charm thick, telling me what a good night it would be with him. I owed him because of God knows what. He flashed that dead smirk again. I refused and he immediately got angry. He yelled at me that I didn't need to be such a bitch about it. I thought we were friends, the whole lot of it. I refused still. When everyone figured out I would not be persuaded, I hugged one of my friends goodbye, whispering in her ear to not ride with Carl under any circumstances. Once they all left, I walked back to the area with the sign-out sheet to cross my name off, since obviously I would not be going anywhere. When I looked at the sheet, though, and saw where my name was supposed to be, my stomach dropped. My name had already been erased from the sheet. While listening to other stories of this nature, it reminded me of one of my own I had thought long forgotten. I'm a South American woman, 
but I've been living in the States for about 11 years now. I first moved to Colorado when I was 21, to the small mountain town of Silverthorne. I was recruited by an exchange student program for college students in South America to come to the USA, work and travel during summer break in the South. Up to that point, I had never seen snow in my entire life, so I was extremely excited to be living in a cold, snowy place for once. I was going to be working at a very popular hotel in the town of Frisco, not too far away from the area I was living in. I lived in a hostel at the time that in itself had its own creepy stories, but I won't talk about those at the moment. That'll be for a later time. So far, I didn't actually know exactly what kind of job I was supposed to be doing in the hotel. All I knew was that I was supposed to show up there on a certain date and a certain time to talk to the owner. He was a Ukrainian-American guy that was probably in his mid-40s or so. I show up, introduced myself with the basic English skills I had at the time, and told him I was very excited to get my start working there. He gave me this weird, long stare, as if he was analyzing me. He was a very tall man, with extremely pronounced eyebrows. The way he was looking at me was kind of unnerving me for a moment. He showed me to the restaurant, and said I would be working there as a hostess, delivering room service orders occasionally as well. I didn't really think my English was good enough to be in such a position back then, but he still insisted. For those familiar with this area, this part of Colorado is not too far from Vail, and needless to say, it gets very, very busy during the ski season. I was dealing with customers from all over the world. Eventually, I also had to start helping out as a server during breakfast, and of course, we would get lots of orders wrong because of my lack of English understanding. The owner would get very mad about this. I remember one time that my coworker and friend was taking a bit longer to wipe down one of the tables, and we had some guests waiting to be seated. I remember he just grabbed the towel out of her hand, yelled at both of us to get out and stop being so damn useless, and then slapped her in the face with it. Let me just make a small note here to say that this girl was also an immigrant like me, but with more fantastic English, and having lived in the country for years. He would always try and find ways to pick fights and show us how slow, dumb, and inferior we were to him, a natural American citizen. At night, after the place had slowed down a bit, he would act all apologetic and buy us drinks at the bar, make forward comments about my appearance, and even try to caress my legs. I was starting to be very weirded out around him, and would always try to not be in the same room he was. During work hours, I would be focused on customers, or talking to my co-workers, and would never make eye contact with him if he was present. On New Year's Eve that year, there was this big incident at the hostel I lived at. I was out at night with a few co-workers, but learned later that one of the residents had gotten way too high on who knows which drug, and started chasing down one of my friends with a gun. Yelling slurs, making death threats, he got arrested, but it was safe to say that most of the people living there no longer felt quite as safe. While telling the incident to one of my co-workers the next day, old Big Boss overheard the conversation. He came over and asked if I was okay. I thought he was just being nice for once and thanked him for checking. He said I should not be staying there anymore given the circumstances, and invited me to stay in one of the hotel's rooms, free of charge for the next two weeks. I could just leave when I found a new place. That seemed very generous of him, especially given the fact the hotel would be completely booked very often, since it was in the peak of ski season. Still, I accepted his offer and moved in the next day. I was overwhelmed with happiness for finally having some privacy. I was sharing a room with five others back in the hostel. I was also excited to get some extra sleep before working the breakfast shift, since I was now literally living at my workplace. That was until one night later that week. I remember I was extremely exhausted after being slammed in the restaurant all day. 
I was ready to get cozy in my hotel room and go to sleep. I was off the next day. Around 2 in the morning though, I woke up completely groggy and noticed that the door to my room was wide open. I could see lights in the hallway and I noticed the silhouette of a very tall person standing beside my bed and watching me sleep. I couldn't see a face, but I could definitely tell it was a man. As I started realizing what was going on, I heard a metal clanking noise. I looked and saw he was getting ready to take his belt off. What the hell? I yelled out in surprise and fear. The person quickly ran out of my room. The next day, I asked management and my co-workers. I said there had definitely been someone in my room the night before, and if they knew anything about it. They said I was probably dreaming, or someone from housekeeping must have gotten the wrong room. The wrong room? At two in the morning? Housekeeping? The owner didn't comment on the case, and stopped talking to me or even acknowledging my presence after that, much to my relief of course. Nothing else happened because soon after I moved on, I got a new job, a new apartment to live in, etc. About a year after my little incident while checking the local news, who do I see on the front page? It's him, the owner. He had been arrested the night before after getting two female hotel guests way too drunk at the bar and letting himself into their room once they'd crashed for the night. They woke up and there he was standing in the room staring at them, getting ready to attack them. They screamed and called the police, and luckily they arrived in time. Was it him in my room that night? I'm 99% sure it was, but I'm kind of relieved I didn't have to find out. What creeps me out the most about this situation is, what about those nights I completely crashed after one too many drinks? You know how the altitude can affect your alcohol tolerance, and oh man, it really did for me. I remember a few times waking up with zero memories from the night before. The unsettling question is, was that the first time he entered my room? How many more guests at this hotel had had this even happen to them without ever knowing? I'm a 22-year-old woman who just moved to a small town in Virginia with my dad in October of 2015. We were having some problems with a leaky shower in the bathroom adjacent to mine. You know, typical new house problems. Of course, we called the plumber to come fix it, who arrived around 8 o'clock the next morning while I was getting ready for work. My dad let him in and apparently went down the street to gas up his car, then go to work himself, leaving the plumber and I alone in the house. My bathroom consists of just the toilet and a vanity with a door, leading into the shared shower room that connects to my dad's bathroom. While I was getting ready in my own bathroom, there was only a single door between the plumber and I. I guess he figured out that I was still in the house due to my hair dryer going off. Next thing I know, my bedroom door was thrown open and there was a toothless behemoth of a man, kind of looking like Wario and Waluigi combined into one big plumbing mess. He locked my door behind him and then walked five feet towards me, stopping right in front of me. I froze, all while he was staring at me for the longest 30 seconds of my life. He broke the stare eventually and cracked this wide, toothless grin. He started scanning me all over with his eyes, gazing up and down my body like he was sexually sizing me up. Just then, I heard the front door open. The plumber twirled around on one foot, unlocked my door, and ran out. My dad ran in after him asking if that guy had really just been in the bathroom with me. After silently nodding, my dad took off to chase after him, but the freak had already driven off at this point. Oh, and he left without fixing our shower either. My dad immediately called the plumbing company and tried to explain what happened to the manager. They proceeded to tell my dad it was our fault the man had entered my bathroom because I didn't lock the door properly. They did end up sending another plumber to fix the shower afterward. My dad told me he only returned to the house because he'd forgotten his wallet, 
I have no idea what would have happened to me if he hadn't returned in time. You know, it's kind of crazy looking back on it now. When I was 17, I was always in Yahoo chat rooms. Always chatting with people I didn't even know in the local Seattle rooms. Well, this one guy and I chatted quite a lot and decided to meet up one day. When he showed up, though, it was obvious the guy had lied about everything. The age, what he looked like. The guy even admitted he'd lied about having a job. He showed up to the meeting in a bus. We started eating at a restaurant, and I said that it was nice to meet him, but I had to go. As I started to walk away, though, the man followed behind me. I walked over to a burger joint nearby. I didn't live far away from the area, and I didn't want this guy to follow me all the way home. My mom was a flight attendant and was out of town. She had about a week left until her days off from flying, so I really didn't want this guy to know where I lived when I'd be home alone for an entire week. I started telling him I had some appointment to take care of to try and shake him off from continuing to follow me. He insisted it was okay and that he would simply go with me for company. Not knowing what else to do, I stopped at a bus stop and waited for the bus to downtown Seattle. He stopped too and jumped on the bus with me. The whole ride he kept trying to talk to me, asking me all sorts of questions. I would answer with the bare minimum, in between telling some lies. I didn't really want him to know anything about me now. At one point he tried wrapping his arms around me. I leaned away, so he tried putting his hand on my thigh. I told him I really didn't know him well enough for him to touch me. I felt sick to my stomach. The whole bus ride I was trying to rack my brain on what the hell to do once I got downtown. How was I going to get rid of this guy? Once I got downtown, I walked over to the building where my best friend's mother worked. Since I knew the layout of the building, I could play it off and lose him hopefully. I told him I had to use the restroom and asked the woman at the cafe inside if I could use it as well. She agreed but I knew that there was a service delivery door that led to this hallway, and the hallway led to some back rooms that led to all the different shops, and a service elevator which would take merchandise to shops on other levels. I exited through the back door into the hallway and left the building out the door next to the docking bay. I took this as my chance to make my way to a bus stop sneakily and go home. I was going to take the express bus and get off at the airport, instead of the other bus that took forever. As I made my way to the bus stop, I could see the guy in the cafe still searching for me. I managed to make it onto the bus and never saw the guy again after. However, a few nights later, I was on Yahoo Chat again when a person messaged me. I told him I wanted to see a picture to know exactly who I was talking to. He sent me one and when I saw it, I instantly picked up the phone and called one of my friends. I started talking to him, asking him a question. Hey, are you on Yahoo Chat right now? No, why? Someone is trying to talk to me and they gave me a picture of you. When I went back to talking to the guy online, he admitted it was not him and admitted his true personage. He said he'd felt we had a great connection, but lost me when we went downtown. He professed his obsession for me. I cussed at the guy and told him I lost him on purpose. I changed my Yahoo name and never met anyone from Yahoo chatroom in person ever again. I have a couple of creepy experiences that I can share from my third year of medical school, which is when everything is still new to you pretty much. You have no idea what to expect or how to handle some of the stuff you'll encounter. So, psych rotation at the state mental hospital, we went to evaluate a middle-aged woman with a history of visual hallucinations and some erratic behavior. All throughout most of her interview, she looked at the floor and responded slowly with one-word answers. Very flat tone of voice, clearly schizophrenic, but not really showing any of the symptoms that have brought her into the hospital in the first place. 
All of a sudden, as I'm thanking her for her time and about to leave the room, she jumped up and grabbed the lapels of my white coat, surprisingly hard. She got right up in my face, close enough for her breath to fog over my glasses. I didn't say a single word. I knew I must have had the most intense look of fear on my face. She just stared right into my eyes, breathing hard. I froze. I didn't know whether to push her away or to say or do anything. I had no idea what she was going to do to me. She held me there for about ten seconds before other staff rushed in to help. Those few seconds, though, were absolutely terrifying. The following second incident happened at a hepatology rotation, which for non-medical folk is the liver disease service, mostly alcoholics with cirrhosis. Cirrhosis is a rough disease and is eventually fatal without a transplant. Alcoholics tend to not qualify for transplants in general because most of them don't want to stop drinking and many don't have the adequate social support to do so anyway. We only have a short supply of organs to give after all and we only give them to those who will get the most medical benefit from them. You don't want an alcoholic to get organs that could have gone to someone else, keep drinking and then die the next year anyway, or scar up their liver from the further drinking. Most of the patients I saw were in that sort of situation. Bad symptoms, no hope for a transplant. Most of them had severe hepatic encephalopathy, as well as delirium and confusion. All that alcohol waste builds up and affects the brain once your liver can no longer get rid of it. I remember one patient who was really out of it. I couldn't even get words out of them, just grunts and moans. He surely didn't have long left in this world. The family had just decided to stop treating the disease and make him as comfortable as he could be so he could die at home in peace. I remember walking in that morning to stop and get some meds for him get him ready and send him home to pass away in peace. He was sitting up and eating a bowl of cereal, looking completely lucid to my surprise. Really shocked the hell out of me. He normally couldn't even control his arm movements. No way this guy could be eating cereal, let alone holding a spoon. I cautiously asked how he was doing today. I hadn't heard him utter a word the whole month he'd been there. He'd been in my service the entire time, and I'd never seen him speak. He turned to me and said in a very clear voice, I'm dying soon. I haven't got a lot of time. My jaw just about hit the floor. All of a sudden, he was back out of it again. He dropped the spoon and spilt cereal all over himself and could no longer control his body. I figured that lucidity was some sort of freak occurrence. I went to his bedside to examine him. About halfway through the exam, he stopped groaning and became lucid again. I think it's about time I get out of here, he said to me. Immediately, he slumped back into V-fib arrest. I think about that moment every time I have a dying, delirious patient. I'm always half expecting some crazy moment when they suddenly become lucid once more and call out their own death like that. I always wonder how he knew, what he was feeling that would make him say that. You encounter some truly strange things when you're working in the medical industry. I worked at a campground over the summer and agreed to do security watch on the Tuesday after Labor Day. It was completely empty all day long, pretty much. We spent most of it cleaning and repairing various items in the campground. It was also a family campground with tons of things to do. Zip lining, paintballing, go-karting, hiking. It was relatively large, approximately 50 square acres. Anyway, I'm doing security, which mostly consisted of driving around in a golf cart and making sure people weren't doing anything suspicious. That night, a motion sensor went off on the upper loop, which had been out of use since July for renovations. Usually when a sensor goes off, it's a raccoon or a deer, but we always have to check anyways. I make my way up to the motion sensor, which was constantly going off on my way up there. I logged it down on our notebook. Once I got up there, I could hear a lady's voice singing in the middle of the night. 
Confused, I walked around and started heading towards it. That was when I noticed a 40-something-year-old woman in a dress just walking around singing. Once she saw me, she began sprinting to chase after me. I ran as fast as I could back to the golf cart and took off down to the main office. I called the police, but they were going to take close to an hour to get out there. I stayed locked up in the office until they got there. I remember she chased me all the way down to the front door and screamed at me, pounding on it the whole time. When they got there, they arrested her, and we went up to the same loop where she was to look for more. I swear, looking for more drug addicts hiding in the darkness was more terrifying than being chased by her. She had been living in one of the yurts we had yet to get to for over two months. She looked like a witch, honestly. The yurt was destroyed, and we ended up having to burn it down. 